Okay, in case you haven't been living under a rock or you haven't been coming to class, don't forget we do have an exam Wednesday, a week from today. Okay, it will cover chapters one through four, so make sure you look over those chapters. Um, as a reminder, on Monday, the day before the exam, I will have a practice exam that we'll go through. It'll be 20 questions, uh, five from each chapter, so you get an uh, idea of the kinds of things that you might see on an exam. Um, there should be an opportunity, if you have any lingering questions as well, that you can ask on Monday. So, uh, Okay, so we were looking at um, Chapter 4 and going through some general information, um, the metric system which everybody should be familiar with. Um, some people, interestingly, are not familiar with it, though, and it takes a little bit of time to get used to. Um, I actually prefer working in kilometers now than miles. It just makes sen more sense to me than miles do. Um, and one of the other things that we were looking at was the surface area to volume problem for cells. And this is a limitation on the size of cells. If you have a single large cell in this figure, um, it's 30 micrometers on a side. The surface area is 5,400 square micrometers. Um, that surface area is probably not going to be able to serve the volume of that cell. Uh, instead, if you break that cell into a bunch of little cells that are 10 micrometers on a side, then the total surface area for those cells is 16,200 square micrometers. And so what that does then is it provides more surface area. It provides plenty of surface area for, for the cell to be able to do all the things it needs to do. Bring in nutrients, um, bring in oxygen, get rid of carbon dioxide, that sort of thing, get rid of wastes. So there's a size constraint on, on cells. All right. And uh, I should have showed this on uh, <coughs> the last time, but here's a question that sort of asks, can you convert <coughs> between um, the metrics, the different versions of the metric system? So we've got a cell structure that's 350 nanometers in length. So how many millimeters is that? Let's take a few seconds and see if you can figure that out. <coughs> There's actually a couple of ways to do this. Um, one way is to simply convert nanometers into meters and then convert it back into millimeters. Uh, that's one way to do it. The other way is to just do a little bit of algebra using exponents, and, and that's not a problem either. Um, a nanometer is 1 times 10 to the minus 9th meters, okay, if we're using scientific notation. So um, we could convert that into meters and then convert back into millimeters. But what I did is I just said, well, a nanometer is 10 to the minus 9th meter, millimeter is 10 to the minus 3rd meter, and the difference is 10 to the minus 6th. Okay? When you're dealing with exponents, it's actually fairly easy to mess with because you just add or subtract as the need arises. Um, so the decimal needs to be moved to the left six times. So that's what I did. And I added a zero where necessary. So 350 nanometers is 0. .000350 of a millimeter. Okay. You'd add three more zeros onto that to find out what fraction of a meter that 350 nanometers would be. Okay. So uh, hopefully you remember how to work with exponents, because that's what you've got to do when you're working with scientific notation and uh, the metric system.
Okay, um, we divide cells into two major categories, prokaryotic and eukaryotic, based on a number of things, their structure, um, the kinds of things that we find in them, their metabolism, although um, for many cases, pro prokes and eukes do things very similarly. Um, we also divide them based on their, um, the sequence of their genetic material, which tells us a lot about the evolution of cells. Okay. So two broad categories, they sort of fall out along domain lines. If you remember those three domains from chapter one, um, the archaea, the prokarya, and the, uh, the archaea, the bacteria, and the eukarya. Okay. Prokaryotic, prokaryotic cells are a lot smaller and they're a lot simpler. They don't have um, a lot of the internal uh, structures that eukaryotic cells do that, say, plant, animal, fungus, or protist cells do. Right? They lack a nucleus, okay? and as I said, they lack most of the organelles that our cells have. And here, for example, is a typical prokaryotic cell. It looks fairly complicated. It's a bacterial cell, and there's a number of structures that you see that make this thing look like a fairly complicated structure. Uh, there are these flagella or tails. Singular would be flagellum. Um, those are the structures that the, the bacterial cell uses to move around. Okay, not all bacteria have flagella, but many do. Um, it has a uh, capsule around it, which is um, composed of mostly polysaccharides. It has a cell wall, which is composed of polysaccharides and proteins. It has a cell membrane or plasma membrane, as all cells do. Okay. Um, it has uh, what we call a nucleoid. That's the region that contains the DNA. It has ribosomes, which are involved in making proteins. Well, so it looks like it, oh, and it has these, uh, these little fingers or tubes sticking out of the surface called pili. Um, those are actually used to exchange genetic material between cells. That's how bacteria do sex. Um, so it looks like a fairly complicated cell. Okay. So several different kinds of structures. Some internal architecture is there. But you don't see, um, <clears throat> when you compare this to a eukaryotic cell, you're not going to see any comparison at all in terms of complexity because um, this area in here looks fairly open. There's not a lot of architecture there, at least in this cell. All right, so you look at this, this thing, then you look at this thing. Okay, no comparison. This is an animal cell, and you immediately see lots of things that you didn't see in the prokaryotic cell. You see lots of internal membranes. Um, making up different structures like the rough endoplasmic reticulum, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus. The nucleus is surrounded by a membrane. That's where the DNA is. Okay? The cell, the prokaryotic cell doesn't have a nucleus, so its DNA is not protected and separated out from the rest of the cell. Um, there's some other internal things we see. Uh, mitochondria and this little furrowed structure here that's involved in energy production. Um, the centriole, which is involved in cell division. Okay? Various elements of what we call a cytoskeleton, which is a support structure for the cell. Cell membranes, are, as we see down the road, are fairly fragile. You've got to be able to support them somehow to maintain the integrity of the cell. The cytoskeleton does that. The cytoskeleton also serves as a railway for the cell because you can move all of these um, organelles around on the cytoskeleton. Right. Um, there are things in this cell that we don't find in most <coughs> plant cells. Here's a flagellum, okay, like the bacterial cell, except it's a much, much different structure. Um, lysosomes, which are sort of the garbage disposals of the cell. They break down uh, old um, organelles. They break down proteins, other molecules that have worn out. Okay. And as I said, the centrioles. Plant cells don't have centrioles, but they still do cell division, so they do it a little bit differently than animals do. All right. Um, basically, what this chapter is going to do is go through a very quick, brief tour of this cell and talk about all of the functions of these organelles.
Yeah, we don't go into them in a huge amount of detail. We spend basically the rest of the term talking about uh, what some of these organelles do, but not all of them. All right, now here's a plant cell for comparison. Some major differences between animal and plant. Plants have a cell wall, all right? Well, so did the bacterium, but the bacterial cell wall is much different in structure than the uh, plant cell wall. Bacteria don't make cellulose. Plants do. Okay, you remember from chapter three, cellulose is a polysaccharide made of glucose, and you have those alternating bonds, glycosidic bonds in it. All right, so you don't find that in animal cells. Uh, chloroplasts, which are involved in photosynthesis, capturing light energy, converting it to chemical energy. We don't find those in, in animal cells. The plant cell is almost completely taken up. In fact, this one's been shrunk a little bit. It's almost completely taken up by the central vacuole. A lot of times when you look at plant cells, that's really all you see is the central vacuole. And all of the cytoplasm and all the other organelles have been sort of squashed up against the cell wall. Um, the central vacuole has a number of functions that are similar to other organelles in animals. The central vacuole is like a lysosome for the, for the plant cell. Other things that you see are similar to the animal cell. There's a nucleus. Um, there's internal membranes, the, the rough ER, the smooth ER, the ribosomes, um, Golgi apparatus. So all those things are pretty much the same. But there are some very important distinctions between plant and animal cells. Now, your book doesn't show a fungal cell and it doesn't show a uh, protist cell. Um, part of the reason is because protists, some of them are plant-like and some of them are animal-like, so it's really hard to categorize. But for fungi, um, you would, they look very much like animal cells, except that they have cell walls. Right. So keep that in mind. All right, so the, the plant-animal cell architecture is much more complicated than what you'd find for um, uh, prokaryotic cells. So keep those distinctions in mind. All right, so here's a uh, tran uh, transmission electron microscope image of prokaryotic cells. That dark stuff that you see in there, that's all um, DNA and cytoplasm. Okay, it's circular. Um, the DNA molecule, the ends of the DNA molecule are just wrapped back on themselves in the end, bound by covalent bonds. Okay, so it's a circular molecule. That's another distinction between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Prokes have circular DNA, eukes have linear DNA. Okay, you can't see much else at this resolution. The, the dark band around the cell is the cell wall. Okay, so that's easily distinguished, but really very little else can be distinguished. Okay, here's a eukaryotic cell. This is a paramecium, which is a protist. Okay, lots of more things going on in this cell. I've labeled some of the structures that you see here. Uh, the nucleus, okay, right here, that's the nucleus. There's a groove in this cell called a food groove, and that's where um, food material comes in, usually bacteria or smaller protists or algae. Um, that's what these things eat. And so that food is brought into this food groove, and we see some what are called food vacuoles. Those are just membrane-bound bags in which um, the material that's been taken in is being broken down, digested. Okay. This cell has um, these little hairs sticking off of the cell. They're called cilia, and those are used for movement. Those cilia um, actually bend in a wave-like pattern, so the cell is basically swimming through the fluid that it's in. But this image doesn't show a whole lot of the internal architecture of this cell. There's got to be a better way of looking at these cells. Well, you can stain the cells with various dyes. That's what's been done here. Um, they've been stained with a red dye, and these are plant cells. And really all you see is the cell wall, which is very dark. It outlines the cells. And then these little red dots in here, those are the stained chloroplasts. But even there, you're not seeing a lot of the other structures that we know are in cells. How do we know they're there? Well, it's because of pictures like this. Okay. This is a transmission electron micrograph of a root tip cell from a plant, probably an onion. Now we can see some of this internal architecture. I've labeled 
There's a few labels on here, but I've labeled some of the other structures in here. Um, cell wall, plastid, Golgi apparatus, mitochondrion, various vacuoles. We can easily see the nucleus, the nucleolus, where ribosome, some components of ribosomes are made. It's much darker. Um, all this dark and light stuff in the nucleus that you see is DNA associated with proteins. Okay. And then we have endoplasmic reticulum, but it's a little bit difficult to see here. All right, so the electron microscope has really been instrumental in telling us more about cellular architecture. What's there? Um, genetics, biochemistry, physiology are this, the disciplines that have told us how that stuff works. Okay, so that's what we really get into when we get into cell biology. All right, so summary of prokaryotes and eukaryotes. <coughs> prokaryotes, they lack many organelles. They don't have extensive internal membranes. Some of the more complicated prokaryotes will have some internal membranes. But for our purposes, we can just generalize and say, well, as a general rule, they don't. Right? They don't have a nucleus. Their DNA is circular rather than linear. Important distinction. Right? The cell wall of a prokaryote differs from the cell wall that you'd find in a eukaryote. Right, much different architecture. The cell wall of a plant cell is made out of cellulose, and the cell wall of a, of a bacterial cell is made out of other polysaccharides and proteins. Right? So eukes, they have lots of internal membranes, lots of internal organelles. Their nucleus is present, and they have linear DNA molecules, okay? typically more than one. Okay, we can divide the eukaryotes then into uh, broader categories. We'll deal mostly with animal and plant in this class. But animals lack a cell wall. They don't have chloroplasts. They don't have a central vacuole. Plants lack the flagellum. Most plants lack the flagellum. The lysosome and the centriole. Okay, so there are the distinctions. <coughs> All right, so a prokaryotic cell would be expected to lack. This should be baby simple. You just saw it. The answer is C. Okay. Should be fairly obvious given the summary that I just put up, but prokaryotes lack internal membranes, right? So a membrane-bound digestive system is a definite no-no for a prokaryote. You're not going to find those in prokaryotes. Okay? So the answer must be C. One thing we need to do before we sort of get into talking about the organelles and cells is to start to divide them into categories so we sort of keep everything straight. Um, it's very easy to get lost when you start thinking about all of the internal structures and what they do. It's best to sort of study them by studying in categories. What organelles are involved in transport of materials? What organelles are involved in energy usage? and production. What organelles are involved in cellular support and maintenance? Okay, so those are the kinds of categories I'm talking about. This first category, the endomembrane system, is involved in transport. Okay, endomembrane just means internal membrane system. Okay, um, the nucleus, which is the control center of the cell. Okay, that's where the DNA is. That's where the genetic material is stored and begins to be expressed. So that's a very important um, sort of brain of the cell. The rough ER, or endoplasmic reticulum, I just usually use ER because it's much easier to say. Um, it's a central receiving station for materials that are going to be transported to other locations in the cell or outside the cell. Okay, so it receives materials for export. The Golgi apparatus sorts and ships those materials to their final destination. Right, and the smooth ER, 
um, is sort of doing several things. Uh, it's making lipids for the cell. It is involved in detoxifying uh, materials, poisonous materials in the cell. It is involved in routing materials to the Golgi, where they are eventually sorted and shipped out to their final destination. Okay, so smooth ER does a lot. Um, and the amount of ER that you find in cells really does depend on the function of that cell. A liver cell, for example, would have a lot more smooth ER than some other cells because liver cells are involved in detoxification. <coughs> um, that's, been, that's been demonstrated because you can take mice and feed them barbiturates. And then once you've gotten them made into little drug addicts, what you do is you take their livers, and you look at the cells in the liver, and they're just jam-packed full of smooth ER, desperately trying to detoxify all that barbiturate you're giving them. All right, so we know that the smooth ER is involved in detoxifying poisonous material. Lysosomes are involved in the endomembrane system, and they're involved in breakdown of substances, materials that come in from outside, um, worn out organelles, uh, worn out proteins, okay? So all of those things would be digested and recycled in the lysosome. So you can think of it as a recycling center for the cell. Vacuoles. Um, there are a number of vacuoles in the cell. When we say vacuole, we sort of just mean a membrane-bound bag that has some particular function, whatever that function may be. And, and it's a catch-all term. There are lots of different kinds of vacuoles in different cells that do different things. All right, so we'll look at some of those, but not all. all right, so the endomembrane system is a major component of the cell. It's a trafficking system. There are energy converters in the cell. Okay, two major types of energy converters. The mitochondrion, which is present in essentially all eukaryotic cells. Right? And the mitochondrion is involved in harvesting chemical energy. Um, we're going to find when we look at chapter 6 that our main energy source is um, carbon chains. We can break down those carbon chains and harvest the energy the, that's inherent in those bonds. That's what the mitochondrion does. <clears throat> the chloroplast, which we find in plant cells and some protocells, harvests light energy. It captures light energy, changes it to, chem to chemical energy. Okay. And at that point, then, that chemical energy can be used for other cellular processes. So two major energy converters in the cell, the mitochondrion and the chloroplast. There are support structures for the cell. The cytoskeleton is what's supporting the cell in large measure. Um, and there's several components of that that we'll talk about. Movement is provided by cilia, uh, the little hairs that you saw in that cell I showed a little bit back. Uh, flagella are used in movement. Okay. And junctional complexes. Cells have to talk to each other, um, especially in a multicellular organism. Right? If cells next to each other can't communicate with each other, then they're very isolated and they can't organize themselves into tissues and organs and organ systems. Okay? So one of the hallmarks of being multicellular is that you have to be able to communicate with cells. They've got to talk to each other. And they've got to be able to connect to each other and hold together. Right? Um, tissues are under a lot of stress, and they'll rip apart if uh, there's not some really solid junctions between those cells. Okay, so um, what I want to do with the rest of this um, chapter is just go through the major organelles and briefly discuss what they're involved with, right, what their function is, because that's basically what this chapter does. All right, the nucleus. Um, it is a double membrane. Okay, so it's got two membranes doubled up on each other. Um, it has some complex pores that grant entry and exit. These pores, um, we're still trying to work out exactly how these pores work, but they're made up of, in the case of vertebrates, they're made up of over 100 separate proteins that are involved in moving materials in and out of the nucleus. 
Um, clearly, it's very important to control carefully what gets into the nucleus and what gets out. After all, that's where your genetic material is. Right? And, and if a cell um, has, suffers damage to its genetic material, it could be disastrous. Okay? So they have to be very careful about it. It houses the DNA of the cell. It manufactures some components of ribosomes. That happens in the nucleolus. And here's what it looks like. <coughs> okay, the nucleus with its DNA uh, and associated proteins. That's what this term chromatin means. Chromatin is DNA with its associated proteins. The nucleolus is making some components of ribosomes. And all along the surface of this nucleus are these pores, nuclear pores that allow entry into the nucleus <coughs> and they allow materials to come back out. Notice that it is continuous with the rough ER. Okay. <coughs> All right, so what does the rough ER do, as long as we're talking about it? It's covered with ribosomes. Um, the reason it's covered with these ribosomes is because it's involved in receiving proteins that are um, destined for export to other locations. Right? Um, typically outside the cell, but these proteins may be going to other organelles in the cell. Okay? So it's not really making them, it's more receiving them. The ribosomes are the things that are actually making those proteins. Okay? Rough ER does not make more membrane. Your book says it does. Okay, so mentally correct that. Rough ER is not involved in that process. It's smooth ER that does that process. All right, that's very clear. And I think your book was trying to simplify, and it's a little bit dangerous to, to oversimplify in biology. We have to do it, but you have to be careful about it. All right, rough ER does receive proteins that are placed into lipid bilayers. All right, so it is involved in the lipid bilayer, the lipid uh, membrane production process. It's just that it's doing the protein part, not the lipid part. Okay. So when proteins are received by the endoplasmic reticulum, they're being made by ribosomes. Here's our protein that's being basically funneled into the rough ER through a gap or an opening. Okay, those pores are not always open. They only open up when they're receiving a protein and then they close back up again. That protein, polypeptide, may then have sugar chains added to it to become a glycoprotein. Um, then it's packaged into a vesicle, a little lipid bag, which buds off, and then that um, secretory protein inside this transport vesicle goes to typically the Golgi apparatus where it gets modified and then sent to its final destination. So that vesicle would not be going to the surface of the cell. It would be going to the Golgi apparatus. Okay. Um, rough ER and smooth ER are very similar to each other um, in that they are continuous structures. Right, how the cell maintains its integrity between the rough ER and smooth ER is not well understood because they are functionally very different from each other. Okay, it lacks the ribosome, so it's not receiving proteins for export to other locations. So it doesn't have those poor proteins in its membrane. So that's a difference. It's much more tubular in shape. Um, the rough ER is like a flattened stack. Or, or those little flattened um, pieces of membrane. The smooth ER is much more tubular. Okay. So it looks a little bit different. Okay. This is where secretory vesicles actually form, is in the smooth ER. Not the rough ER. The rough ER sends materials into the smooth ER, and then those materials butt off, and they go to the Golgi. Okay. So not from the rough, as your book claims. All right, some other functions of the smooth ER. It makes lipids for the cell. 
It's not the rough ER that's doing that. It detoxifies poisons and drugs. It's also involved in calcium uptake and storage, which I didn't mention earlier. Um, cells use calcium for a lot of different purposes. One of those purposes in muscle cells is to allow for muscle contraction. Right? Without calcium, your muscles couldn't contract. Uh, but you don't want them contracting all the time. So what happens in, in muscle cells is that the calcium all gets pumped into the smooth ER and stored until the muscle needs to contract. And once that happens, the calcium is all released and contraction occurs. Right, so calcium uptake and storage is an important function of the smooth ER. Okay, so we can compare the rough and smooth ER both in diagrams and in electron micrographs. <coughs> right, here's the nuclear part of the nuclear envelope. It is continuous with the rough ER. Notice how flattened this rough ER is. It looks like those are separate stacks, but they are not. That is all continuous. It's just because we happen to have sliced it through that particular angle that makes it look like those are separate stacks. They aren't. Right? In addition, it is connected to the smooth ER, which is much more tubular than the rough ER. Okay? So we see that they are connected. How the cell maintains the difference between the smooth and rough ER, we have no clue. In an electron micrograph, we see that they look pretty much like this diagram. Here's the rough ER. It's got ribosomes on the outside, these little dots. Okay, this white gap in here, that's the inside of the rough ER. And then it becomes smooth ER. And you see how much more tubular that smooth ER is. It also looks like it's a little bit more disorganized. It's got lots of these tubes all sort of jostling around each other. Okay, so the smooth, the nucleus rough ER and smooth ER are all contiguous. They're all connected. This, we don't know how the cell keeps them sorted out, but people are working on that. And make sure you notice the difference in structure because it really relates to the difference in function of these organelles as well. Okay. The Golgi apparatus. The Golgi apparatus is a sorting and um, shipping center for the cell. Okay, it receives material from the ER, those little uh, vesicles that butt off the ER. They simply fuse with uh, Golgi apparatus. Uh, it sorts all the material it receives and then ships all that material to the final destination for that stuff. Usually proteins are what we're talking about here. <coughs> all right, so the, the rough ER just basically sends everything it receives into the Golgi. It doesn't sort much. It's the Golgi that does all the sorting. Okay, it returns ER-specific proteins back to the ER. The endoplasmic reticulum has some proteins that need to stay with the ER. But what happens is since the ER sends all those proteins to the Golgi, those proteins get involved as well. They just get sent indiscriminately to the Golgi. The Golgi has to pick those up and send them back to the ER. Okay, so that's what I mean here for ER-specific protein. Um, when you look at the thing, it looks like uh, flattened stacks of membrane. And unlike the rough ER, these stacks are not connected. They are separate little pancakes of membrane. Okay, so as materials move through the Golgi, they, get, they move from one stack to the next stack to the next stack to the next stack. And as they move through, that's where the sorting process occurs. We're still trying to work out the details of that sorting process. We don't understand all the details of it yet. It's been one of the big mysteries of cells. Okay? So we won't even get into it. It's way too complicated for this class. Just realize that that's what's happening, is everything's getting sorted. It's getting sent to its final destination. Right? So here's the Golgi. Um, it's easy to spot in electron micrographs because it's really distinctive. We have this sort of semicircle of flattened stacks of membranes. There's lots of vesicles around it. All of these little um, <coughs> white circles, those are all vesicles that are budding off from the Golgi apparatus. Okay? It has a uh, receiving side 
So that's where the vesicles from the ER come in. So that would be up here. These are vesicles that are being received from the ER. And then those, those materials pass through these stacks and are butted off in more vesicles, but this is the shipping side. So they've all been sorted, and all of these vesicles are labeled or tagged for their final destination. It's really what the, the Golgi does. It figures out what needs to go where, puts, them in a, puts all those materials in a vesicle, a membrane bag, and then on the outside of that bag, it puts little tags, protein tags, that basically tell the cell this goes to the outside of the cell, or this goes to a peroxisome, or this goes to a mitochondrion, or whatever. Okay. So it uses separate tags for each of those destinations. Okay. Um, there are some other processes that involve the endomembrane system in cells. Uh, exocytosis, endocytosis, and cellular digest digestion. Okay. Exocytosis is movement of stuff out. Okay. Exo meaning out. <coughs> Usually that stuff is, is moved out um, by vesicles. You get a vesicle that just moves up to the lipid bilayer of the cell, the cell membrane, and it just uh, fuses with it, and so it pops open. And all the stuff inside just flows out. Simple enough. <coughs> Endocytosis is the opposite process, where a little vesicle buds off of the cell membrane and captures stuff inside of it, whatever happens to be there. So that's internalization, endo meaning inside. Okay. Lysosomes are involved in this process. They digest damaged organelles. They digest uh, material that's been endocytosed. So if the cell brings in proteins from outside, for example, those would end up in lysosomes. They'd get broken down, and the amino acids would be recycled. All right, so the lysosomes really are uh, recycling, digestion and recycling centers for the cell. All right, so let's summarize this um, system. Okay, with lysosomes. We've got our rough ER. It receives proteins, including proteins that are eventually going to end up in lysosomes. Those um, so-called hydrolytic enzymes are enzymes that break down macromolecules. Remember that macromolecules can be broken down by hydrolysis. So any protein that does that process is a hydrolytic protein or hydrolytic enzyme. All right, so those, pr those uh, proteins are sent to the Golgi. They get sorted, uh, finished, packaged into lysosomes. All right, so they receive their digestive proteins from the Golgi. Uh, materials then coming into the cell from outside. Those vesicles fuse with the lysosomes and you get digestion of those materials. Okay. So the lysosomes fuse with the incoming vesicles, and that's how you get digestion of those materials. And those materials, for the most part, can be recycled by the cell. Okay. Uh, lysosomes may also completely engulf damaged organelles. If you've got a mitochondrion that isn't working anymore, why have it sitting there doing nothing? There's a lot of proteins and lipids that you could recycle. So why not do that? Well, that's exactly what cells do. Okay, so here's a lysosome that is engulfing a damaged mitochondrion. It'll break it down, and all of those lipids and proteins and, in fact, nucleic acids as well will get recycled. Okay. Um, there are a number of diseases that are known that result from defects in lysosome function. Okay, there's a lot of different proteins that are required in lysosomes to break down all of the varied um, macromolecules that might come in. Polysaccharides, proteins, lipids, um, nucleic acids. You need different enzymes to break down all of those different kinds of molecules. And so if you have defects in those proteins, that is, you have a genetic defect that prevents you from making the correct protein, you end up with what we call a lysosomal storage disease. 
right? So cell locking with the enzymes can't break down all those materials. They build up. And in many cases, that's toxic to the cell. <coughs> so there's lots of these diseases. One for every hydrolytic enzyme known, basically. And they have, um, they have funny names that really don't describe the disease itself. Um, Hurler syndrome, Hunter syndrome, they're named for the doctors that discovered them. But they can be, they can be pretty severe. Um, Hurler syndrome and Hunter syndrome cause severe mental retardation. They cause uh, uh, retardation and growth. Um, they cause what we call a gargoyle face where the, the facial bones develop abnormally um, and they tend, to, they tend to jut out from the face. Okay. So Hurler and Hunters are pretty nasty. There's some others that aren't quite so nasty. San Filippo disease is one. Um, eye cell disease, you can usually survive. We don't have very many good treatments for these diseases. Okay. So people with these diseases, they either suffer from them or they die from them. All right, um, here's a review of the endomembrane system. <clears throat> you should think of the ER as the local post office. It's just receiving indiscriminately any protein that's going to go somewhere else. Okay, and it sends all of those pretty indiscriminately to um, the Golgi, okay, which you can think of as the regional um, or district receiving and sort sorting station for all that mail. Right. Then the, the other vesicles, the secretory vesicles are the male carriers, and they d deliver all that material to where it's supposed to go. It's a good analogy for remembering what does what in the endomembrane system. Okay. Um, this is a good stopping point, so I think I'm going to go ahead and stop there. Uh, a little bit early, and we'll start getting into the energy production organelles next time.